you are welcome to the maiden edition of Journey with Masterwell. My name is David Masterwell. Here I attempt to explore the totality of my guests' life, their achievements, their struggles, and the impact they made on the world around them and beyond. My first guest is a wonderful woman I admire so much. She's a complete trailblazer, a woman of many firsts, and a woman with strong affection for the mother continent. I first met her over five years ago at the screening of my documentary film, Gold is Here, and we've kept in touch ever since. Let's listen to Brenda Joyce. My name is Brenda Joyce, and I'm the head of a company called African Heritage Precious Metals. I'm a gemologist, and I've lived in Ghana for eight years. I've lived on the continent for 23 years now, having lived in South Africa for 16 years before relocating to Ghana. I have dual citizenship of the United States and the Republic of Ghana. Take me through your upbringing. How was it for you, a black girl growing up in America in the middle of the 20th century where black Americans had limited rights? Well, I was fortunate in growing up. I was an only child of uh, a father who was very hardworking, a very good provider, and a mother who was also very hardworking, very talented, very skilled. and. Uh, between the two of them, they presented a number of resources. I was actually born in a town outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The town was so small that it didn't have a name. It only had a number. It was called Mine 3. And that town was a coal mining town. And I think that growing up in that town was probably the beginning of me having an affinity for mining communities and mining towns and villages. It was very much like a, vi like a village. When I was um, still very young, preschool, we moved into the big city, Pittsburgh, and my schooling started there. I was the granddaughter and am the granddaughter of two preachers. So I grew up in a church tradition and with a very Christian ethic, uh, work ethic, and was taught from an early age that I could do anything that I wanted to do. I could achieve anything I wanted to achieve, but I was going to have to work harder for it than other people did because I was a black girl and I had to be better in order to get an equal opportunity. My father, although he was very hardworking and successful by most people's standards, he owned a house and cars and was able to afford private lessons for me from, the, from an early age and all the way through school, things of that sort. He still daily had to confront the uh, many atrocities and many things that were demeaning to him because he was a black man. He was always very aware of the fact that he would not be allowed to go as far as his capabilities go or his, as far as his capabilities would take him because of discrimination, because of segregation. I think to boost himself, he became a student of African history. So there were always books on Africa and African history around the house, stacks of them. And my father and my mother would read to me from those books when I was a child and make them available to me. But I lived just like um, uh, all aware black people live daily with the pain that he suffered and the injustice of the segregation, because segregation was still going on, although slavery was, was uh, not going on actively, segregation was. And uh, my parents were very much a part of 
the movement for equality all through my formative years. How did the great civil rights era of the 1960s shaped your formative years and who you became as an adult? Well, the first thing is living in Pittsburgh, um, there was segregation, but not segregation like there was in the Deep South. And I remember one summer, uh, my cousin and I took a trip down south to visit my grandmother's people in South Carolina. And it was the first time that I had been in the Deep South. Um, when I went, I was uh, a nice little colored girl with, um, I curled my hair and straightened it, and I wore pretty dresses all the time, and I hadn't really been sensitized to direct prejudice. But when I went down south, and it was like a reawakening for me, because it was the first time that I realized the depth and the scope of how we were discriminated and, the, and our heritage. Before that, I just kind of took it for granted, but I didn't particularly identify with it. But after that trip down south, I was another person entirely. So Brenda, I want you to share with me some of your career highlights in America, Africa, and around the world. My first job was when I was 16 years old and my mother drove me, put me in our car because I always liked nice cars and houses and clothes and everything. And she said, girl, the things you like, you need to be able to make money. So she put me in the car and we drove to downtown Pittsburgh and she said, get out of the car and go get a job. And I said, but mother, I'm just 16. I'm not even allowed to work. She said, go get a job. Go, go, go figure out. She wanted me to really go through that experience, and I did. Again, I had the good work ethic, and I talked my way into a, a job and became an elevator operator in a department store. Um, in later years, I went to school, and I had a career in music for a number of years and traveled extensively as a singer. And... Um, then I came back to um, Pittsburgh and um, took a corporate job. It was one of the first, uh, I was one of the first female professional hires in a corporation in Pittsburgh in those days. That led me to a career as a lobbyist with an oil company, uh, the first African-American lobbyist, federal lobbyist for uh, in the oil industry in the United States. And in that job, I started traveling internationally. One day, the president of the company called me in Washington, DC, and asked me if I would do him a favor and go to Nigeria on behalf of the company. The, uh, the president of worldwide operations was having difficulty in putting the Nigerian National Corporate uh, Oil Company and the personnel of the oil company that I represented together to renegotiate the oil leases because the relationship between the two entities was so bad. So he sent me to Nigeria to renegotiate the oil leases and to get both sides sitting at the table it just so happened that it was during Festac when African people from all over the world were being called and came to celebrate and to show their culture. And it was fascinating to see, to get, it was the first time I had seen the African world, the diaspora of the African world. And it changed my life forever. I went back to the city, resigned my, my position. I had been offered a position with, by the government of Nigeria to represent them as their lobbyist. So I had a firm contract and deposit in my bag 
when I returned to the U.S. I resigned from the corporation and started my own company, lobbying for federal governments. Um, so some of the clients of my company were uh, Nigeria, of course, Liberia, uh, later Panama, uh, Luxembourg. I did business, of, a lot of business in Europe at that time, and Italy and France. Um, so it was, at that point, I was kind of operating on a worldwide scale, always with this notion that when it was time to retire, I was going to become a gemologist. And I wanted to become a gemologist because I liked diamonds and I liked gold. And I thought that in my retirement years, that this would be a good career for me. I could just sell a few diamonds a year and that would be a, a, a good retirement. So I went back to school and became certified as a gemologist. Let's take a break and listen to a Negro spiritual from Brenda Joyce. One of the joys that I found in Ghana is some of the most wonderful musicians and singers and performers that I found in any country. A great deal of talent, and now there are a lot of venues that feature jazz and gospel and uh, blues and all types of musical forms. Um, I've been a singer all my life. I'm the granddaughter of two Pentecostal preachers, so in my family, everybody sang and everybody cooked. It was a prerequisite for being in the family. Um, since I've been in Ghana, I've had the honor of being asked to sing a spiritual at some of the uh, special events that we have around historical occasions in Ghanaian culture and that are very meaningful to the diaspora community. I'll share one of those with you. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child Sometimes I feel Like a motherless child A long ways From home So Brenda, I want you to walk me through your encounter with Africa. How has your relationship with the continent evolved over the years? I became a gemologist the same year that Nelson Mandela became out of, came out of prison. And the year that he, uh, I started reading what he wanted to do to build the country and what he wanted to do with with the precious minerals of the country and how he wanted to develop them and make, prepare, make advantages and opportunities for the people who had previously been locked out of the, uh, of the industry. And I started selling um, gold and diamond products from South Africa in the United States as South African products. Of course, they had been under boycott before. So they were selling their products, but they couldn't sell them on the table as and label them as South African products because of the boycott. So the door had just opened. I began to sell products that they identified for me, jewelry products, 
and other products and had a great deal of success with selling these these products in in a New York City in the New York City market. Uh, at that time, I got an award from the mayor of New York City as the International Businesswoman of the Year for the City of New York, and that happened to be the same year that Nelson Mandela came to New York for he received a ticker tape parade and all kinds of accolades, and there was one event that I was invited to, to meet him. And there was a line of about a thousand people. We had about three seconds each. The Secret Service was standing on either side of him, and everyone was to shake his hand and say a word, and they took your elbow and moved you along. So I saw the setup and I said, I'm not going to get in that line because I want to talk to him. I don't want three seconds with him and then to have to fight the Secret Service. I want a conversation. So I didn't get in the line. So after a while, he noticed, I guess, this lady who's not in the line. And that made him curious. So after a while, he left the line and walked over to me and very humbly said, Hello, my name is Nelson Mandela. And that's how we met. <laughs> I was amazed, of course, by his humility first. And, but I had a lot that I wanted to say. I, wanted, I had studied his plans, his uh, reconstruction and development plan for the, for the nation. Uh, and I had all kinds of ideas, and I also had experience because I was the only person at that time who was marketing the gold and diamonds of South Africa as a branded product under a South African brand. So I just talked to him and talked to him and talked to him, and the Secret Service would come up and he would wave them away, and then he'd ask me a question, and then I would talk another several minutes at the end of the conversation, he said, I want you to move to South Africa. And frankly, I wanted to visit South Africa, but I was doing so well in New York City. I didn't really want to leave New York. <laughs> but he insisted. He said something that I'll never forget. He said, I need you. You're the kind of person I need to build a new nation. And if Mandela says that to you, after all he had suffered, and uh, how can you say no to Mandela? It's impossible. So subsequently, I moved to South Africa, and I was there for 16 years. During that period of time, I met uh, people in, in Ghana who were in the gold business and was hired as a consultant to a Ghanaian mining company who brought me to Ghana. And then I became a consultant to the government of Ghana and beneficiation of, of raw materials, mineral, mineral resources. And I was writing feasibility studies and doing business plans and things of that sort around beneficiation or value addition of particularly the gold of Ghana. But all the time, I was falling in love with the country. And um, I found myself, while well, I was coming for business four or five times a year. But then when I had a holiday weekend, I found myself getting on a plane and coming here to, and even for two or three days at a time when business didn't require it. And after Mandela passed, I said, well, I'm going to go back to New York. I'm just going to stop off in Ghana for a couple of years and start a mining company and do some things, do a few things in gold. And that was eight years ago. <laughs> and I'm still here. I'm a dual citizen now. I have Ghanaian citizenship as well as citizenship still in the United States. And um, I'm quite happy here. I, I like the opportunities that I have. I like living here. I like the people very much. The music scene is wonderful. Uh, and I found that I'm very content. If I could just bring all of my children and my grandchildren and my family and all of my friends over here 
to be with me, I'd be 100% con content in Ghana. <laughs> Looking at the geopolitical landscape today, especially in America, there are African Americans who are thinking of relocating to Africa. What would be your advice to these people? Well, you know, it's a, it's a very sad thing, but uh, people of African descent who live in Western countries really know very little about Africa. And uh, that's Africa from a historic sense or present day Africa. You know, the images that we see and that are perpetuated through the media and through books, as well as the history that is deliberately left out of the history books, uh, does not adequately give you, give one uh, an idea of what Africa is really like. Um, it's not just uh, prim the primitive um, uh, living conditions, although there are bad living conditions, um, there is a range of living conditions as there, is, as there is in the West. And there are opportunities that you don't have if you live in the West. So I think you know, during last year, the year of return, when the government of Ghana um, summoned people of African descent to come back to the continent to, 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 like a, to, to take a look at Africa again and to learn something about it and to see if there's a way that you fit into it. I think that was very good advice. I'm very happy that hundreds of thousands of people took that advice and returned to Ghana and to Africa. And I think that's created a rebirth and uh, a regeneration of the interest in living in Afri Africa and making a contribution to the development and the growth of the continent as well. So I think that's very good. Once you come back and take a look, everyone isn't going to decide they want to live in Africa. You, you may want to visit more. You may find a charity that you want to support or a cause or a product that you want to export from Ghana. There are many ways of being involved and Africa needs the talents of all of us who have lived in the West and gained experience and education. This is a place where you are not judged by the color of your skin, uh, where you don't have to be better to be treated equally. Uh, you can excel. Your abilities allow you to excel and you're welcomed because of your capabilities, not suppressed. Brenda, you've lived in several African countries over the years. Are there any particular countries in Africa that you would recommend for African Americans who are looking for alternative homes on the continent? Well, I would have to, to start with Ghana. I've lived in a number of countries. South Africa is wonderful for different reasons, and it has problems and a different set of problems than Ghana has because of its history. Um, it's, I think it's best to look around. My, I would start with Ghana if, if, if I were you. I mean, of course, this is where I have wound up. So I can't say that I'm an un, my opinion is unbiased. It's very biased. But uh, I certainly think wherever, if you go to another country, if you have, if there's another country, African country that appeals to you, then go there. Just go on a, on a holiday, see how you like it, get the feel of it, because a lot of the things that we talk about and that we examine when we're considering another country are tangible things like what's the availability of housing, uh, what's the cost of housing, can you buy a car, what's the cost of this, what's the process of this. They're tangibles, but there are also intangibles. Um, in living in Africa. First, you can breathe. You're free from a kind of stress that you've lived under so long in the West, whether it's yourself 
that you're worried about, your livelihood, your health, your life, or if it's that of your sons, your grandsons, your brothers. Um, there's a stress that goes with life in the West that you're free from when you come to Africa. So come to Africa wherever you like, start wherever you like, but while you're looking, look at Ghana. In the next episode, we embark on the final leg of our journey with Brenda Joyce as she reveals how the violent Liberian coup d'etat of April 12, 1980 affected her and why she left Africa and vowed never to return again. Thanks for joining me on this journey. My name is David Masterwell. Midasi P. Sometime I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometimes I feel like I'm almost gone. Sometime I feel like I'm almost gone. A long ways from home. A long from home